Welcome everyone to another episode of Afikra Conversations. Our special guest is Hisham Fagi, who is the director of the Middle East, Mid Middle East Media Initiative, MEMI, at USC's School of Cinematic Arts. Hisham is a Saudi multi-hyphenate creative straddling both Western and Arab audiences. His work has been written about by the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Rolling Stones, BBC, Variety, among others. For acting, Hisham's rose to international acclaim when he uh, co-produced and starred in Saudi Arabia's submission to the Oscars Best Foreign Film of 2016, Baraka Meets Baraka, which won many prestigious international awards. And in 2017, when Netflix bought the distribution rights to the film, became the first Saudi film to display on the streaming service. He uses comedies to highlight social issues by turning them on its head using comedic tools. Hisham questions cultural norms, even the most ubiquitous ones. Hisham, welcome to Africa Conversations. Thank you so much, Mikey. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. I've been wanting to chat with you for a while, and um, it's fun to uh, speak to somebody who loves comedy so much. So my first Thank question you. to you is, what did you find hilarious as a kid? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I was exposed to Pee Wee's Playhouse at a very young age, and I think that's what probably yeah. messed me up. <laughs> but until this day like I, I go back and watch it and it's uh it was you know hbo bought the first special it came out of the groundlings um and there were really big people like phil hartman used to play play the pirate character and yeah of course and it was considered like supposed to be like this weird sort of postmodern um surreal piece of art surreal. yeah like that's supposed to be for adults but it has like childlike sensibilities and years later after I studied the groundlings it sort of made sense but to be like three or four years old and watching that and all the weird noises and that musicality I think really informed me and then you know the basic things that kids like farting burping you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah uh, for sure that's all I can remember like really from my childhood but I I had um I had a recorder and I would just do like interviews with myself by myself. I was an only child for the first like seven years of my life. So I would just make myself laugh. Yeah. That's really how it started. Were you the type of kid that was um, liked, uh, like making people laugh? Were you in it for the show from the very beginning mm -hmm. or were you sort of in a conversation with yourself? Yeah, no, I was a very shy kid. Um, you know, one day when I'm rich enough, I'll get my diagnosis as someone with an official neurodivergency but now I, I my dad is one of the funniest people ever meanest but also funniest people you'll ever meet and for me I knew like I could hear his musicality in Arabic and sort of his 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 ways of making jokes and then you know hearing my mom's sort of musicality as well and and trying to just you if you make somebody laugh it's a survival instinct you know like mm -hmm. on a deep sort of primitive level they're less likely to kill you. I mean, people yeah. have written about this in history. And and I think spreading joy, and not to sound cliche or anything, but spreading joy is like one of the best things you can do to, to draw a smile on someone's face. Now, comedy yeah. can easily become oppressive and you can punch down and it can be a tool of controlling semantics and all that. That's a, that's a weird tightrope uh, walk yeah. that everyone has to do in the comedy space. Yeah, it's tricky. I feel like there's, um, I mean, obviously there are not only two camps, but two sort of approaches to comedy. There are like, I feel like there are those who use comedy as a way to reveal themselves. Um, and then there are those that use it as a way to conceal themselves. Mm, that's um, really good. And I wonder which one you do. Do you, like as a kid, did you feel like you were using this to be like, please accept me or like, please don't pay attention to me. Let me put on a mask. Damn, are you talking to my therapist or something? <laughs> These are good questions. Um, honestly speaking, I just want, I wanted to be seen. My parents were really big personalities, you know, probably more self-absorbed than they needed to be. So a big thing was just see me, see me, see me, you know, yeah. and uh I can even see it now, you know, I, I'm raising my youngest brother and he's so funny and I can see he's always like telling jokes or trying to impress me with his jokes because he wants mm -hmm. to be seen. And I, so that I, I try to make him feel validated outside of comedy. I'm like, you're really funny, but you're also very sincere and sensitive. And that's why I love you, you know, so, but definitely I wanted to be seen. And I think most 
if I were to boil it down and, and, and be reductive, I think most people just want to be heard and seen that get into the performing arts. Yeah. I don't think that many people have like, <clears throat> excuse me, like a prophetic sort of need to send a message that I think that comes secondary after you work out all the sort of kinks in your, in your journey and your, and your narrative, but really it comes down to, uh, I need someone to hear me, you yeah. know? And uh, yeah, it's like somebody was telling me they were reading, um, there's a book of like 40 biographies of presidents of the United States and all of them have like daddy issues, you know, just that the dads didn't pay enough attention to them and that's why they got into this. So their dads would finally sure. respect them, you know? Let's um, let's talk a little bit about some of your earlier career before we get into Memi. Most of what we're going to talk about today is going to be about what you're working on now. But just to get a sense of your broader perspective, um, when did you like a lot of people who know you know you because of um, or first heard about you because of you know this viral song "No Woman No Drive," which was came out in the earlier part of the 2010s. Um, yeah. You know, when did you first think to yourself, this is what I want my career to be? I want to be a professional creative. I want to create stuff. I want to be in production and uh, performance and, you know, music and comedy and film. When did you think to yourself, this is actually what I want to spend most of my time doing? No, I was a, I was a later bloomer. I didn't, I didn't do musical theater in high school. I, I hosted a couple events when I was in college and, and to my friends' credits, like I had friends telling me you need to be doing stand-up, you're funny and all this stuff. And I was just, again, it was like a confidence thing. I was like, no, I shouldn't. Uh, and then it was like after a, a major breakup where we, <clears throat> that, you know, when you find yourself like at a loss and an all-time low and you're looking at what, who am I? What, what do I want to do with my life? And I was like, okay, I really like, Chappelle, for example, Chappelle show started the year I think that I moved to the States in 2002 or three. And I was I was living in Florida and you so know, a lot of it resonated. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like I was mostly the only brown kid. Definitely like, I know a lot of big Bigsby's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I probably wanted to be one, you know, deep down inside. But when Chappelle came out, it was like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. And it became like a North Star for me. Sure. So I guess a, a decade later or so, I was like, I should, I should try this. Yeah. And, and I did. And I had beginner's luck. I was actually good my first time. Yeah. And then I didn't get last for like six months after that. But concurrently, you know, I was, I was performing. I started in D.C. I was performing in New York. And, and you, York, you went straight into stand-up. You weren't thinking about sketch or improv. No, I didn't know that was I didn't know that was an option. You know, yeah, I, yeah um, of course. For me, like I, I stumbled upon a podcast called uh, WTF with my, yeah, Mark, Mark Maron. Of course, the best, yeah. like that that person is the person that I owe my career to because I would just listen to interviews, and they'd be like, "You have to do stand-up for 10, 20 years, and nobody will laugh." And I'm like, "Okay, that's normal." So I'd go to these brutal open mics and, and nobody nobody was laughing and and it was okay for me because I heard like the elders say that it was okay. And then somebody, I think it was Amy Poehler is the first person who talked about improv and UCB and I had just arrived uh, in New York and I went and signed up for a class and my first improv scene, I was like, oh, this is so much better than stand up for me. It just feels you're building if you fall you don't fall completely on your you know, on your face by yourself like yeah. you, at least your scene partner is there with you so I lashed on to improv and then I got into sketch in a big way but That's stand okay. up to be honest is what like brought me into the scene and um and I was I was decent to be honest but I I, I wanted to do something more collaborative yeah so um, what was your day job at the time? Was that what you were doing um, yeah. fully? I mean, I was studying uh, in New York. I was getting my master's at Columbia. Um, and at the time, Saudi Arabia had this like full, full ride with stipend yeah. um, scholarship. And otherwise, I would never be able to afford to go there. Shout out yeah. to expensive tuition. So I, I, um, 
I was studying, you know, I was working as a TA, like I would correct homework and stuff. And, sure. But it wasn't enough to sustain. And then whatever extra money I had after I paid rent and the train, I would go and sign up for one class or pay for open mics. And um, that's really, and then I that's, this is where I, I got clever as I, I, I tutored kids, and especially like in Arabic. And then I got really busy. And I was like, you know, I'm too busy to do this. And they're like, we'll pay you anything. And, I, and then a light bulb went off. I'm like, oh yeah, these kids are rich. So <laughs> I just started making like stupid money tutoring and that. And then I was able to like sign up for more classes and do later open mics and go across town. So that's really how I got my bread and butter. I was really privileged to have this uh, scholarship yeah. and to be in a, in a place um, where at Columbia, like in the Middle East Studies program, I'd say like, it was mostly brown kids, you know, and yeah. maybe there was like a couple white kids, mostly all brown instructors. Sometimes the instructors were fully switched to Arabic mid-class, like, and I didn't, and that's when I really came into myself as thinking like, okay, you could do this as an academic. You can be your unfiltered self intellectually especially like if you're a tenured professor, you can say and do anything, you know? And, and so I was like, maybe I'll go into academia. And I was writing my thesis on Saudi Arabia and the YouTube mm -hmm. scene specifically because it was, it was this phenomenon that was happening. Yeah. And, um, and then one day I sort of, I put a video online that was supposed to be just for my little sister. And it just went viral in Saudi Arabia and suddenly I became part of the YouTube scene. And... Hmm. And that, that's when it got tricky. Okay, so what that, I want to talk about that feeling, right? Um, the feeling of virality, right? Um, because you've had a bunch of those experiences, right? So what does that feeling feel like for a video that is in, made in jest, right? It is by, it's by design to, towing a line, right? Yeah. How does it feel for that video to go viral and be out of your control? Like it's just spinning. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've used this word a million times and it's very, you know, it's, it's not deep at all, but it's just like, it's crazy. You know, that's the only thing you can say because it, it really scary? is wild. At the time, I didn't realize how scary it was. Like, because I was living in New York and I had my distance from Saudi Arabia, but within less than a year, I lost my anonymity, even in New York. Like I would get grabbed and recognized in Times Square. And I was, I was too young in my career to have this much of a platform. Because I, I believe if you speak for long enough in the Middle East, you will get in trouble. You know, it's just, it's just the nature of respectability politics people don't like airing their dirty laundry and i think if you're talking something's going to come up that people don't like and then the sort of mob behavior of you know virtue signaling or gagging and i think i was able to take an absurdist approach again shout out Pee Wee herman <laughs> yeah. just like when i first got famous i'd have hundreds of thousands of followers and i would tweet out kaka you know the word poop in arabic or yakaka you know and, and and I just, and people liked it because it, it was all part of like this persona performance. But yeah. when I got, when, when, the, when the feeling to make people laugh sort of subsided because I was feeling less seen, ironically, then I started to become more serious, politically vocal. And people don't know that I came from a political theory background, you know? So they're like, well, wait, why are you talking about politics? You're you're a clown. Aren't you that absurdist dude who did X, Y, and Z? And then that's where like the clash happened, I think, after my initial success and you know, viral sort of appeal. I didn't and, and just to go back, the very first thing I did was a weekly show back in 2011. And nobody was doing weekly content back then. Mm-hmm. And yeah. people would wait a month and they would produce. They're basically treating YouTube like TV because, you know, TV was regulated and YouTube was this like democratized um, platform that you could participate in. So I was putting stuff weekly and I was, I was present in a way that no other, you know, I guess creator was present in, in, in Saudi Arabia specifically. 
And I was doing 90 second clips as opposed to nine minutes. And this is something, yeah. you know, shout out to Abby, Abby and Alani, uh, Alana from um, Broad mm-hmm. City. Because I went and I saw a panel and they had just come out of their web series and got their show with Comedy Central. And they said, don't make it longer than two minutes. And everybody back home was doing nine, 10, 20 minutes. And they said to you crazy. specifically or on the panel? No, they did like, a Q&A. Content should be two minutes. Yeah, yeah. They're, like, they're like, that's the trick. It's just keep it short and sweet and let them be hungry for more. So again, privileges of being in New York, having access to the UCB community. You get to yeah. see this stuff and you hear this stuff. And a lot of people, the instinct is to, if people like me, stay longer. And it's very yeah, counter to, know the to exit. get out. Exactly. Oh, well. And so, yeah, I just, I, I, I became contentious with my, with my, with the audiences, with my fame. And I really resented it. And to this day, I do think I have, a little bit of baggage from my fame. I mean, fame is is, is traumatic, and especially yeah. like when I was dating my wife, you know, now, but my girlfriend at the time, we'd get chased and harassed. People would be taking videos of us, and and it's like I don't know if you've heard, but it, you know, you're not supposed to be dating in Saudi Arabia, so it's just like it was a liability. It was yeah. a lot of just I'm a private person. I'm more um, more introverted. I love being a writer. I just love being posted up in my office and writing. And of course, I have my close knit, you know, friends and people that I love. But I get my energy more from just from solitude and 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 quietness. Yeah. So in your in your mind, when you're writing, because of that that friction, right? When you're, mm-hmm. which is a common. It's this is a common. Um, not to say that you're not special, but this is a <laughs> this is a common relationship that comics and sort of. Uh, uh, people who are interested in, in humor have with their audiences, right? Um, but do you feel like, like if you were on the sort of the the stage, the the um, proverbial stage, mm-hmm. is your relationship with the audience like you guys don't get me? Like you guys don't get me. God damn it! Like you suck, yeah. right? In some way, um, where it's this sort of adversarial thing constantly, or you're like, please get me. Oh yeah, I mean. The, the reason why I went absurd all the, all the time was because it was absurd. People would bring yeah. newborn babies to my stand-up shows because suddenly now really? stand-up comedy was the big, biggest thing in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And people thought it was supposed to be Masrahiya or Hakawati or, you know, mm-hmm. and they're like, why is this guy so boring? And why isn't he dressed up? And why isn't he doing voices? And why doesn't he have props? And And especially my type of comedy, again, it was like a lot of one-liners, a lot of sort of offbeat stuff. Yeah. Um, it just didn't. So I, I, I sort of reveled in the absurdity. Yeah. Does the, and it was yeah. a shield to protect me because if I engaged with it on a sincere level, uh, it really would have broke my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to switch to talk a little bit about Memi and talk about how that this experience that you're you're describing may actually serve you as a director of this uh, initiative, okay, cool. um, because you're dealing with all these different mm. human who have voices who are trying to represent themselves and trying to have their perspectives be understood. So um, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of it, tell us what is the Middle East Media Initiative? So yeah, MEMI is a, an initiative that focuses on a cultural professional exchange between the U.S. and um, and the Middle East, and specifically on campus at USC. Um, our founder is uh, the chair of the writing department, David Isaacs, um, and uh, Rachel again and Mark. They she has sort of like a history in diplomacy. She was running something, or still is running something called the American Film Showcase, and they started this Middle East uh, media initiative between like. Initially, it started with like some, you know, a couple embassies and like, I think NBC at the time, Middle East Broadcast. And they were like, the, the, the first iteration of it is like, TV's bad, what can we do? And I think that's always, people can discern that. That's the first step of, well, some people are in denial, but the first yeah. step towards recovery is just being like, okay, be aware what, you're not the best at this, you know? And I think there's a number of reasons behind it. First and foremost, the fact that people have to do 30 episodes. You know, Ramadan is our Super Bowl season. And 
I haven't watched anything that's 30 episodes um, in America. There was 20 something, for example, but the, you just feel like it's being stretched, right? Yeah. I don't think um, very few people can do it. You can do 30 episodes over multiple seasons, but 30 episodes yeah. a season back to back. And my friends, sometimes they're shooting literally in Ramadan, the day of the episode, and they're editing really quickly. And Jeez. But that's sustainable. And, yeah. and I hope it changes. We're in a conundrum culturally because the tradition of people gathering around the TV and, you know, bonding over these characters, that's a big part of it, you know? Like we grew up with Tash Matash in Saudi Arabia and that really influenced yeah. multiple generations and it started a lot of conversations, some good, some bad. Um, some people were happy, some people were upset, but nonetheless, that's a, I think it really engaged the community. And what happened was now the best TV that's happening is happening outside of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. um, this sort of shorter series, mini series are, you know, by standards of Middle East, like 12 episodes or eight episodes, or more recently, people have done six. So that's really cool. Um, but they knew there was a problem. And a lot of people, my background is in development. Like but right after I graduated um, college, I went into development. I realized how big it was and how small I was. So I jumped ship. But this feels like an extension of that development brain or hat. And yeah. you can assume that if I just if this person just goes with a good instructor that'll fix them and it's like no it comes down to curriculum and, and this instructor doesn't understand the culture so how is this person there are fundamentals in storytelling of course so the big part and I think the biggest unique um, edge that Memi had was that it's always been run by Arabs like my predecessor Dina Nassar She's, she really designed the program in a big way and was gracious enough to bring me on as a consultant five years ago. And I just, I was very aggressive. I was like, this mm -hmm. is wrong, this is wrong, this is gonna, and they always just were so um, like graceful and they would call my bluffs. Cause I would be like, this is wrong, I'm not gonna do it. And they're like, okay, do what you want. So I'm like, for example, there's a problem with you know, accessibility, people speaking English only being in this program. I'm like, then you're perpetuating a class problem with the, you know, disparity. And they're like, okay, what do you want to do? I'm like, an Arabic room. And I knew they would say no. And they're like, okay, you do it. And you're like, and oh, so, okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we did it. And it was like one of the hardest things, but also rewarding because they empowered me. And so I felt the, the, the sort of responsibility to rise to the occasion and it was truly hard because we were doing live translation so some of the participants did not speak a word of you know, english and obviously the instructors didn't speak arabic so i was translating and trying to beyond the translation of like you know vocabulary you're also or linguistics you're also doing the technical language and the narrative language so i think they've been so cool about and I think this is why this program has been so successful is they're not afraid to make mistakes they're not afraid to take risks yeah. and when Dina um, left to go work with Netflix there was a job opening and she was asking me she was like do you know anybody who would like to do the do this job and I was joking I'm like maybe I should do it and she's like you're too hot-headed I don't know if you could do it and I was like I think I'm ready to be an adult and like try this out and like be responsible yeah. and rise to the occasion and again yeah I'm coming up on you know my year anniversary in this post and it was easy it was easier than say somebody else who would take this job because I've been a consultant and I saw the behind the scenes and I also get to yeah. learn from my predecessor's mistakes because I was there sort of seeing it but yeah. yeah shout out to Dina one more time because she really did everything from you know from the ground up so Hisham, functionally, uh, let's sort of like go through some of the the um, the just basic details. Like, who are, what does this program actually do, right? Um, who are the people who are part of it? Who are these filmmakers? Uh, are they filmmakers? What, yeah, walk me through it. So yeah, the program is focusing on training or empowering writers to become showrunners. 
Um, so for example, you know, the concept of a showrunner usually is on board uh, from development. They're either a writer or producer who is, you know, an engineering talk, the quality control manager who makes sure makes sure that there's a specific tone, standard, you know, point of view from beginning, middle, all the way through the end of it, right? Um, so for example, in the States, if you look at a show like The Walking Dead, it doesn't have one director doing every episode or one writer, but the, the showrunner is constant. And I think that's where we sort of are missing things um, in the Middle East where there isn't, it just goes from the writer to the producer, the producer gives a script to the director, director gives it to the editor, and then we're done. Um, as opposed to somebody being a constant variable. So we were trying to do that. The first iteration of it, we had writers and producers, and now we phase that out to just writers. So yeah. um, it's five days a week, right? So the first day of the week is like pitching training. So you just figure out like, what's your show in one word? Um, I'll, I'll take it back one second before we get into the schedule. We, we bring 16 projects from all across the Middle East. So we have you know, people from Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Bahrain, um, you know, really. And they're they, there, like it's somebody they come from- to Los Angeles. Oh, they come to Los Angeles, cool. Well, of course, during COVID, people were doing it over Zoom, but this is yeah. the first year we're back since COVID. And um, wow. so I have 16 projects, four projects per room. So there's four rooms with four projects each. So. Tuesday, we do project one. And so the head writer or the person who brought the project basically treats these three writers as if they're staff writers for him yeah. or her, him, her, or them. And then say day two, Wednesday, this person works for this person. And they sort of simulate a writer's room because again, it might seem like a novelty, but back home, there are no writer's rooms. Now people of course are taking initiative but they're taking the pay of one person and spreading it across yeah. a room as opposed to, you know, WGA standards or union laws to give people a specific, you know, um, payment or a floor for fees. We're in the very beginning, especially a country like Saudi Arabia, where it's just opening up now. Like we're in the very beginning. The, these conversations don't make sense. You know, uh, if you're an investor and you're coming from a pure bus business perspective, you're like, why would I pay five writers when I can pay one. All my competitors are paying one. I'd be stupid to do that. And just- What's the answer? What's the answer you gave them? I mean, it's just, it's, it's the quality. It, it, everybody does this and there's a reason. This is not sustainable for you to do it with one writer. Yeah. You're, you get to write multiple scripts at the same time and you have the showrunner sort of checking it. And, yeah. and, and this is a note that I try to give myself as let go of that control and sort of delegate. That's like what really- the people that are able to scale up or the people that are able yeah. to be more expansive, they, they, the, they understand how to be yeah. a leader. And that's part of on the network sort of um, behalf and also yeah. the creators, the producers, the gatekeepers, just yeah. delegate, like hire somebody you trust as opposed to just this crazy paranoia that the industry yeah. is built on and it, it, it's too traumatic right now. It would be the it, equivalent of like uh, Mark Zuckerberg being like, I'm not gonna hire any coders because I'm the- hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, um, you know, him hiring the Winkle Voss and, 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 and screwing <laughs> them over was, you know, a clutch move, you know, yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, that. I don't endorse exploitation or extraction, but I think the, this idea of delegation yeah. is a big thing and trusting yeah. people because Here's the thing, to be honest, these gatekeepers or these people that are um, responsible, they're so worried about getting fired, berated, punished, yeah. you know, fined, et cetera. So I don't blame them for being paranoid. It's a mm -hmm. structural thing. It's a really systemic level. We, we need to like cure a lot of our ghosts, but th I feel like this is a step in the right direction. Now, since the beginning of my career, whether it was like being a YouTube creator, and so now it's always like, I don't want to disrupt and break and challenge. That's not it. Disruption happens organically. And I think that just tension is a, is a normal part of life. But I just want to create an alternative. The mainstream's here. I just want to be here and doing my thing. And then if people want to join this alternative and then it seeps into mainstream, that's great. And so far, that's been my experience. But the mainstream, it's like in poker, when you're up, you do small antes because yeah. you have a lot to lose. 
And for me, you know, I'm still I'm still getting in the game, so I can be more radical, if you will. Yeah. So, um, of these sixteen projects, um, how many of them will see the light of day? Do you suspect? And like, is the is the idea is the vision for the program? Okay, sixteen this year, um, and sixteen next year, sixteen the year after, and then this be, this is going to change the industry uh, in the Middle East. Is that the idea? Is like we need to completely reform the industry. Um, I'm just, and, I'm kind yeah. I'm cautious of that language of change, yeah, reform, because they have like colonial sort of implications. This is my question. Like, yeah. if that's the case, then it should be based there as opposed to based in Well, and that's, a, the thing is, um, the minute the industry opened up back home, you know, as an indie filmmaker, it was a dream come true, but it was also like the harder, I think more, I think mature or long-sighted decision was me moving to the states because i'm like i know exactly the trope we're going to fall into is we're going to basically get these contracts subcontract to white people and because we think the, the west is better than us and back home and then the white people are going to come and then hire the local guys and basically do this frankenstein content or films or tv and then it's going to be yeah. awkward for many years so i'm like let me try to mitigate these really difficult learning steps and let me go. I have this institution that I'm part of and I feel like being in LA, worst case scenario, I didn't, I wasn't banking on getting a job at Mimi, but the worst case scenario, I'll get some experience in the States and then they'll hire me being like, oh, I'm Ricky. Like this guy knows what he's doing. He lives it's in America. Enough. <laughs> and I think that that's a constant sort of ebb and flow yeah. of working in this because you there are two things you cannot deny filmmaking is hyper capitalist mm -hmm. and there are the institutions that are currently in place are majorly colonial if not straight up white supremacist you know and and sometimes they don't do it consciously but just the things that i see on an institutional level i'm like oh you guys don't realize you're being like racist or sexist or you know, colonial. Yeah. And I think having us, you know, people coming in, and, and this is the cool thing is I have people coming in that have Emmys and BAFTAs, international Emmys and BAFTAs. I have people who, who are at Cannes on the red carpet, official selection. So it's like some of these people are more impressive than 99% of the people that step on campus, you know, yeah. even at an institution like USC. And it's this grace and humility from both sides where this person's like, I have all these awards. I can do anything I want back home, but I want to learn. And it's this person that is like, oh my God, I have the responsibility to teach this person. And they're trusting me with that. And I think I've, I've been lucky to come to just be blessed with people that are extremely graceful and humble from both sides. Yeah. There have been a couple bad apples. You know, and I think that's yeah. just, that's a probability that's... thing, you know, but again, Dina like did an amazing job curating and I had a specific point of view, like even the way I did my applications this year was different than previous years. Like I, my application was pretty simple. It was just a one pager, maximum three pages. What, what's your show about? And then um, I think, yeah, phase, that's phase one. Phase two is the first, uh, first 10 pages of your pilot, not even a complete pilot. Then one paragraph, why you're the person to do this. You're the only person or the best person to write this project. That's and amazing. it's all about, thank you. It's all about like introspection and the masculine urge and the capitalist urge in the industry to do something that's never been done before. This is, this is cool and it's innovative because it's never been done. I think don't be cerebral about it, be more visceral and stop trying to be, stop, stop being obsessed with like the bells and whistles and just distill it down. What people just wanna see like a good love story. People just wanna see like honest, you know, portrayals of human beings. Oh shit, that guy reminds me of my cousin. Oh my yeah. God, that's exactly like me and my ex. Like very simple it doesn't have to be like oh the camera goes inside somebody's butt and then it comes out and transition we're in a different time like that's that's silly to me and yeah. i think a lot of people my, myself included like honestly mimi taught me through the years it was like 
and stuff. What's it about? And things like our pitching training, which is going to happen every Monday um, of our program, is things like, what's your show about in one word? What is it about in one word? What's it about in six words? Yeah. Um, yeah. And just distilling it and bringing it down to the fundamentals. And that's, that's really, I talked a long time, right? That's no, no, no. That, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you're working on now. And if that's the case, let me just Ooh. actually uh, do this to you for a second. So um, I want to talk about some of the projects you're involved in right now, like Face Palette. Mm. But before we get to it, let me let me do the same uh, same uh, thing with Baraka Meet Baraka, right? Mm. What's this about in one word? Okay, um, it's about the the philosophical answer is like public space. That's literally how it was it was pitched to me, and then it's about love. Yeah, like simple. It's usually about like here's the, the spoiler alert. It's always about love, vengeance, you know, trauma, like yeah. belonging. It's yeah. really like these universal things that I think can resonate with most people. Yeah. It's like if there's a, if uh, <laughs> there has to be like a hip hop song about it, <laughs> about the I'm same sure thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I want the, I want to talk about um, the experience of making Baraka, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how, and the experience of it being received the way it was received and how that's informed the way you approach projects like phase, uh, phase palette or other things like this. Yeah, I was really, I, I've been really lucky in my career. Um, and I think now I'm reckoning with that luck is I've been, you know, it's my success has come about pretty quickly. Like I didn't have to put as much work in as other people not because I don't work hard, but in terms of longevity, longevity or sorry, time spent, I I had I was like within a year of performing stand up, I went from doing open mics with five people to performing a three thousand, four thousand person show sold out. So that is like really unheard of. But like in a place like the Middle East and specifically in the Gulf and specifically in Saudi Arabia, it's possible. It's possible for you to go from uploading something on Snapchat to headlining you know, a major show or meeting the king or it, it, it's that quick. And it really is like the land of opportunity because it's the only country in the world that's opening up in the 21st century and two decades into the 21st century. Yeah. So, um, but I basically, like I said, YouTube, stand up, and then I got into sketch and variety for a bit. And then when I was at the peak of my, you know, social media sketch variety short film career, I, I decided to make a feature film when nobody was making feature films. And it was, uh, it was stupid, silly, naive, because I was like, this film's going to be so good, they're going to open movie theaters with it. And that sort of, you know, bravado is good <laughs> when you're moving in it but it's unhealthy for your sort of for your long-term mental health. So I, I yeah, made this film. Um, my previous collaborator and I basically sat down and he comes from like a journalistic background. So and I had come from like a more dramatic background. So we had like built it together. Um, you know, Fatima, uh, I had met in one of my acting workshops. She, she was one of the participants and sort of like I coached her, if you will, and we'd like block the scenes together and it was a very like collaborative space and um actually the person who plays my uncle in the film the original person uh passed away like the day before we started shooting oh wow just nice. so yeah i'm barak and Layrhamu, and um and we got this backup guy who was like uh it's a really dynamic person he's one of my favorite humans in the world sammy and but sammy had like had struggled with um, addiction in the past and had like lived many lives and basically had fried his uh, brain cells in a big way and could not, I don't know if he had the capability to read before, but could not read anymore and could not memorize. Hmm. So then we had to restructure the whole entire film and narrative around how, what he would give us basically improvising. So there was a lot of rewriting and it was a really 
I, I think in, up to date, it was one of the most collaborative, collaborative spaces um, I've ever been in. And, um, you know, to my partner, his previous partner is, um, again, Grace, is to give people to delegate the people. Yeah. And then, you know, unfortunately, later on, like it went to his head and he's sort of like, I don't need you guys. And and he's he, he's not been doing well since. But that's another story. But I think really this was such a beautiful experience because it wasn't the best script in the world and it wasn't, you know, not the best talent, but there was a lot of heart in it. And that heart yeah. really, really, really did show through. And then what happened later was... Um, it got into Berlin and I think it was uh, Panorama Forum. I think it was Forum. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was sold out, standing ovation. And it was wild to me. And then I, it, I got programmed at Toronto and that's yeah. where I sold out to Netflix. Yeah, it's been. So, and, okay. And, so, Hisham, I have a question for you. Yeah. Have you had a just an unmistakable failure? Where yeah, you're I, like, oh man, that I thought I was going to hit a home run and yeah. I struck out completely. Because this is where the neurotic side of me comes out, where like yeah. I'll, I'll basically bury it and make it disappear. But yeah, I, I did. <laughs> I know people to make things. I, I can relate. But... I can relate to that. <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, where definitely people see. I do have a great batting average. I'm probably sure. hitting like 300, 400. But yeah. it's all it's also because in reality I'm I'm batting like a 180. But it's because I'll like basically omit things that don't look good. But yeah, yeah. there are things where I got way too cocky and I was like, oh yeah, you, you can do this in your sleep. And that's not the case. Yeah. With this, I with wonder this, like yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, with this first film, it was also very curious because I fundamentally believe that it's about audience. Like when you tell a joke, say for example, to your siblings is different than if you tell a joke to a coworker, than your parents, than your grandparents, there's a different musicality, sensibility and sort of agreed upon language and value system. So I do think there are films that are made in the East for the West and there are things and vice versa, you know? And the second film that I made um, with my current partner, Anas Batahaf, who's one of the greatest humans I've ever met in my life. Met him on the set of Baraka. He was a teenager and he was basically doing everything. Everything. I'm not even exaggerating for me. He was ADing. He would be running around with clothes and blocking shots. And he edited the film, produced it. Like he did everything wow. as a teenager, yeah. like right out of high school. Um, so I like sort of latched on to him. I was like, whatever you want to do. And he came to me with a story that is, um, you know, it, it's it's edgy and it's dynamic. And it's, it's, I think, in terms of the elements that we talk about, it's certainly in the Gulf, it's sort of unprecedented. Um, I won't talk about mm -hmm. the whole entire region, but I was like, yeah, I love you and I support you and let's make this film. And it took us a minute and we, um, and it's been really one of the most, uh, beautiful experiences for me now this film hasn't gotten like the recognition that let's say Baraka did because it's not as accessible um and I mean that actually in a positive sense because Baraka is reductive like I, I do think um there's a lot of like just boner comedy elements of it it's, yeah, it's, just, a, like, it's I, a big tent movie yeah you know what I'm saying and I think yeah there this was trying to be more elevated more nuanced and also like talk about pain in a way that people are not ready to sort of reckon with um yeah. so and what's as a the result, word for this this is pain definitely is pain. pain and but belonging would be if i'm going to use the universal five belonging yeah. is the big one um and then on a theoretical level no, I'm not gonna go there. I don't want to make a cerebral film. I wanted to make like a okay. visceral film. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, I want to do the quick Q and A. Then there will be questions from the audience. Cool, cool, um, cool, cool. Okay, so first question is: What are you reading or watching these days? Oh, okay. Um, so what is by my bed? What I'm actually reading every night. Mm -hmm. What I want to say is what I'm reading is uh, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. 
But mm-hmm. I'm, that's like, what you want to say. Yeah, I want to say because I'll read a few <laughs> chapters, put it away for a few months. Uh, but what I'm actually reading is the Soprano Sessions by oh, Matt cool. Zolderside talking to yeah. yeah talking to David Chase about every single like I've every never episode. seen I've never seen anyone break down a TV show like this. It's a, it's one of the craziest books I've ever read. I heard, yeah. So I told, if you I like the Sopranos, it came out in the it came out during the pandemic, right? It it's, came out like yes. two years ago. Yeah. I yeah. It. It's it's really yeah. incredible. And shout out to Kiva Reardon. She she lent me the book and I can't put it down. And it's so dense. Like you'll read a page and a half and it's about two seasons and there's just so many details. It's really and from a journalistic perspective and from a critical literary analysis place, it's that's why he's one of the best film critics. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't he do the yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we'll keep on going. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Past, present, shadowing. Probably like Andy Kaufman. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, to understand him as somebody who uh as a comic or as a human, I mean, I read all his biographies, um, mm-hmm. you know, and um, watched as much stuff as I can online. And I think he was so enigmatic and so unforgivably absurd, but also there was like a, a gentleness and you could see his pain. I, it's something that's really raw. And I think very few performers are that raw and that, um, that magnetic. You know, because there's yeah. raw where it's too much, and then there's raw where it's like, oh my god, this so, person is so unfiltered. And yeah. it was really interesting to see, you know, like I, Jim and Andy sort of like, did you see the documentary? I didn't watch the the Jim Carrey. The the Jim, Jim Carrey. Carrey. I didn't yeah, watch like it. that was so. It was a bit of a turnoff to see like how how much Jim like leaned into the pain, as opposed to the absurdity of it all, and really made like everybody miserable and. I'm just, I'm turned off by like method acting in a big way because there's so many mm. bad examples and so few good ones. Yeah, you know, so oh, it's just yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, what do you think people most misunderstand about your work? I think they're they're understanding it the way they should. I, I think. Um, in, in film school, they teach you, like, if somebody's telling you something and you're like, oh, yeah, I already did that. Did that. It's like, no, listen. What is the note behind the note? If they're saying the character doesn't seem, the want isn't defined. He's like, yeah, but I, I showed him looking at a poster of this, you know, surfing competition. It's like, no, just listen and be like, you need to show me more. You need to show us this person looking at surfers. And I, I don't know. Like, I mean, it, this is a bad example, but it's just. No, I get it. If, if people are reacting in, in a type of way that isn't favorable to my work, it means that I'm either trying to poke them on an unconscious level or I'm not being articulate or accessible enough. And that's something I wanna work on. And, and during the pandemic, I've written like my first sort of like peace offerings to the industry where I've, wrote, I've written like a family show it's really cool and dynamic and innovative, but it's still like, this is something that a whole family can watch. And I, I got custody of my youngest brother during the pandemic too. And I had to stop watching like, you know, elevated, elevated sort of like art house and more yeah. pretentious stuff and had to watch more family stuff. And I was like, oh, this is beautiful. I get to share this with my family. So that's, that's my, this is like chapter or whatever, the next chapter of what I'm yeah. trying to be. This comes back to that the original question because like there are there would be two approaches right so one approach is um, or two responses two versions of the same thing one I could imagine you saying um, whatever you get you get and you don't understand you you don't misunderstand me because you get to have your own understanding uh, versus what you said which is like I have an obligation to to like to improve my message so that whatever I want them to understand is what I'm actually intending, right? Yeah, and I think it's also like going back to how we learn. Um, yeah. Like a lot of examples that exist are, you know, white men who they pride themselves on being like, you know, unrelenting. And I, I think that's a, 
that's an unhealthy, unsustainable way to sort of move through this world, especially back home, we come from more collectivist societies that the sort of social fabric depends on this interconnected interconnectivity and integratedness in a way that Western individual capitalist society doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Then I have three questions in the chat. So, um, maybe outside of your profession, because I'm sure there's a lot of people in your, inside your profession, but outside of your pre- profession, whose work, uh, do you, insp- uh, inspires you and whose work do you admire? Outside of my profession. Um, so the first, like, I think artwork that really resonated with me, uh, was like Basquiat, like, yeah. you know, John Michel Basquiat and he, you know, died sadly um, in his, you know, later 20s, I think, I believe he's of the 27 club. And he went from being unhoused to the biggest artist in New York City to dead within, I think, four or five years. Um, But Basquiat came up in a tradition where I believe his mother taught art history or taught him art history. So he had seen the whole entire landscape, but then he used these sort of naive, um, naive art motifs to do stuff that is so visceral and raw. Again, back to like what resonates with me with Kaufman, and it's probably on a uh, subconscious level stuff to do with like Pee Wee Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think, um, but it, what is universal? You know, I think yeah. I go, <laughs> sometimes I go to music festivals and, and it seems like music festival is just like, a place for adults to be babies. It's like looking at bright sort of psychedelic um, kaleidoscopes or being, Just playing you know, with the things. <laughs> yeah, being wowed by like the peekaboo or like firework. I, and, and I think that is, there's something to be said about that. Like we're on a visceral human yeah. level. That's all we want is just to be surprised and to be wowed yeah. and, awe, and in awe. He came from inside the stage. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's uh let's ask a couple of these questions. So the first oh. question comes from Nan. We have four questions, so we'll try to go as fast as possible. Um, do you know anything about the Taka series? Um, the YouTube series? Yeah. Taka or Taka? Taka. Yeah, yeah I guess Taka so. yeah. is um, yeah, absolutely. And I want to say I wrote part of my thesis on it, and, um, but that was many moons ago. But Angi Maki is the creator of the show and. Uh, eventual. I think he still directs and writes pretty much every episode. One of the nicest people in the world. Um, cool. He wrote at the time when nobody, again, like just being the first to try something. And let me make this distinct from what I was saying earlier. Don't try to be like overproduced, but just boil it down. He did like a love story, uh, sort of like this love triangle story based in Jeddah. Um, and it was when nobody was doing dramatic content and he did it maybe I want to say again like over a decade ago now I think like 2000 and yeah the early cool. 2012 and uh, now it got picked up by Netflix and I have a couple friends who've written on the show and a couple of them have graduated from Memi to bring the full circle yeah okay um, yeah honey Kadur. cool um abdullah i think is the name um let's see so um i heard about you in 2010 when i was in high school kid in the gulf at a time where it felt like the whole world as young arabs was changing drastically it felt like we uh, were witnessing history and it felt like there was a big shift in the artistic expression of the whole region in the moment too at home and in the diaspora what did it feel like uh, or look like inside hisham's world at that moment did he see that seismic shift in real time too yeah, absolutely. Um, I was constantly just humbled by how much our work was resonated, uh, resonating with people. I would be absolutely lying if I said that we weren't accepted with open arms on a cultural level from society. We were really held in a big way. And of course, there was pushback, but I think normal amount of tension. Um, the, the kinetic energy uh, throughout the whole entire region was being felt. Um, and it was also, I think, the convergence of like the analog and digital worlds. Like we were really moving to where the internet had opened 
us up to each other in a way you know you could connect with somebody that was beyond your neighborhood or your network and people like I met my significant other on Twitter for example so and most of my collaborators to be honest on like YouTube Twitter Instagram now so maybe TikTok in the future but I think the connectivity of it all was really in incredible there was tension like the people that were people that were benefiting from the existing systems didn't want to really, you know compromise um but there was like this heavy medium but i i do think it's an ebb and flow like if you push back and then you know, sort of they'll push back and that's what conversation is it's like a dance and um saudi arabia benefited from say the revolution in egypt because the egyptians were preoccupied with you know changing their country and suddenly, suddenly there was a vacuum for content and where Saudis usually watch Egyptian stuff, Saudis started making stuff and then it was consumed locally. And then it got to a point where people were consuming Saudi stuff in North Africa, you know, and in the Levant and all over the Arab world and diaspora. Uh, Hisham, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, I, you got, I got a good 15 minutes if you okay. need. Okay, all right, let's do one last one. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is the future of filmmaking in the Middle East um, and outside of the universal themes? Is there something that you find essential when crafting a story? Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, I, I've said this in both languages multiple times, um, privately, publicly. If the people in charge, whether that's the governments or the distributors, the networks, if they don't take risks and treat this as um, an endeavor that is different from, say, this is soft power. This is supposed to look, be looked at qualitatively, not quantitatively. You're not, even in my own program, I, I can't measure success. It's not like somebody comes in, if they get greenlit, that's great. And we've had one example of somebody who came in and just became the biggest star, Sara Taiba, who did Jamil Jibbin. But somebody like Sara comes once every few years, if not once every decade. Um, so this idea of like, I invested money in you, you have to be good. That's not, that's not how this industry works. It's literally, it's compounding generational knowledge and expertise and sort of understanding. If I'm lucky, I'll be able to see some of that sort of um, the boom in my lifetime as a, as a, as a filmmaker in my career. But it, most likely it's me laying down the foundation for the next generations to come in and do something. And uh, I don't say that with, I say that with honor and with pride. I don't, I don't say, and, and if you ask me that, if I would have been saying the sentence with cynicism just a couple years ago, but I'm not entitled to success. I'm not entitled to validation. We're on this weird planet, all trying to figure it out all at the same time. Some people are more privileged, some people are less privileged, but it really comes down to, again, filmmaking is expensive. There are hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of billions that are spent, say, in the West on films that flop and, and commercially. There, there are films that you bring the biggest stars and you put the craziest explosions and CGI and it still doesn't work for some reason. And then a film that's a fragment of the budget, you know, surpasses it. So there's no way to measure this stuff. As much as consultants are coming on and as saying this is what we predict yeah trend forecasting is great you know but it's it really comes down to like the essence and some people are blessed with that essence i think like sense of humor some people have it and some people, there are things that you can learn this is the foundation of a joke there's a setup and a punchline but some people it's like music some people are just geniuses they're just prod, uh, prodigies and i think same thing goes with storytelling and same thing goes with like that charm of being an actor some people, you just can't stop looking at them. And I think for us to recognize that and not be um, resentful or jealous, you know, I, I talk about the word hasad and, and, and what its translation is in, in English. And it's like being resentful or jealous of something that you don't even want. And I think yeah. there's, there's a lot of that back home. And I want to sort of, that's part of you know our collective trauma being healed and understanding that there's there's plenty of 
you know, plenty of resources to go around. It's that we need yeah. to get out of the scarcity mentality and, and understand that that person's success is probably connected to my success. But it's hard, you know. Yeah. Hisham, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, Thank you. Really, likewise. really, really appreciate you making the time. Um, this conversation is going to go up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, so if you know folks who missed it and would have loved to see it, feel free to share. We have another conversation tomorrow talking with an uh, academic from Quaid talking about disability studies. And then the next day is with Hiba, Professor Hiba Gawed, talking about her new book, Refugee. So um, talk to you all later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.